Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Narayan, Head of Research and Visiting Senior Research Fellow of ISS, will chair the first session on the topic, Setting the Agenda and Applied Perspectives. I will now pass the floor to Dr. Narayan. Dr. Narayan, please. Thank you very much. And, uh, it's a great honor and privilege to be here. And particularly, I've been given the kind of onerous responsibility of starting off the first session. And it's very interesting that uh, we are looking at the conference theme of Afghanistan in transition beyond 2014. And the first theme is, is uh, very aptly titled setting the agenda and Afghan perspective. I think if you really look at it, the very word setting the agenda becomes an important underlying thought for this conference because the agenda can be looked at from different points of view. Of course, it's easy to understand from the media that uh, the, the agenda from, let us say, the US point of view would be how to withdraw quickly, how to bring in democracy, how to make sure that the terrorist enclaves do not uh, continue to be a problem for the United States. It's easy to look at it from the United States point of view, from the NATO point of view. But I think it's much more important to look at the agenda from the Afghan perspective. And that's where we have three very, very eminent speakers here. And I will introduce them one by one. But uh, I got just the Professor Jalali, uh, Ms. Fauzia Kofi and His Excellency Mr. Stanisai bring to this table uh, an amount of experience, political knowledge, and uh, perspective that I think would be quite unparalleled. So, without uh, uh, much ado, may I just request uh, first Professor Jalali to introduce him. Professor Jalali is the former Interior Minister of Afghanistan between January 2003 and 2005, and is currently serving as both a distinguished professor at the Northeast South, North East South Asia Center for Strategic Studies, MESA, and as a researcher for the Institute of National Strategic Studies. He has been involved in politics and media most of his life. He previously served in the Voice of America for over 20 years covering Afghanistan, South and Central Asia and the Middle East. He has written extensively about the military in Afghanistan for scholarly journals and the mass media, in addition to reporting on Afghanistan and Central Asia for VOA for almost two decades. He is the author of several books, including a three-volume military history of Afghanistan. Let's say a lot on that. His most recent book, the Other Side of the Mountain 2002 was co-authored with Lester Grau, and it's an analytical review of the Mujahideen War with the Soviet forces in Afghanistan from 79 to 89. His areas of interest include reconstruction, stabilization, and peacekeeping operations in Afghanistan, and regional issues of affecting Afghanistan, Central, and South Asia. And the title of his presentation that he has chosen is challenges and prospects of transition and impact. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Narayan, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I uh, thank the uh, Institute of South Asian Studies of uh, the uh, Singapore National University for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to share with you my views uh, on a very important issue of transition in Afghanistan. It's also, my, I'm pleased to be the first, uh, for the first time in Singapore, the so-called war in sunny city. And I uh, learned this morning that uh, even in Singapore, I'm not away from Afghanistan, since there are streets named Kandahar and Kabul this uh, great city. Uh, so I'm uh, very pleased to be in Singapore at the same time in Kandahar and Kabul. Uh, my remarks today reflect my personal views, and not necessarily those of the National Defense University, 
to the Department of Defense or any agencies of the United States government. Uh, I was asked to set the, uh, I want the panel to set the agenda. And the first speaker has a problem. It has to play two rules. One, to set the agenda that others can, can build up on this in the, in, the, in the other sessions of the conference. The other one's a negative rule. It has to serve as a sacrificial lamb. Because whatever he says, then it will be challenged by other speakers during the, the conference, and then he will get many rocks from it. I'll play both rules. So therefore, if I'm a little provocative, it's intentional. And uh, now speaking about the situation in Afghanistan today, in one word, it's good. In two words, not good. <laughs> and in order to temper it with some positive uh, color, we can add a third word here, <coughs> but we can improve. So this is actually that we are looking forward in the next three years. The next three years, Afghanistan is expected to undergo a complex process of transition in security, polit political and economic spheres. The country is scheduled to take over full security responsibility by 2014 as the bulk of the NATO troops draw down. The dynamism of these intertwined shifts will shape the end state with long-term impact. The transition, of course, is not coming just all of a sudden. The transition comes against a backdrop of many years of poorly sourced in ill-coordinated reconstruction efforts, leading to continued insecurity <coughs> and violence that gradually peaked to the highest level since the removal of Taliban from power in 2001. From the outset, the reconstruction goals were too ambitious and the resources dreadfully limited. An under-resourced, inconsistent state-building drive amidst a rising insurgency, failed to match the challenges of ground reality. In Afghanistan, political leaders missed emerging opportunities and failed to rise above factional and ethnic rivalries in the interest of building national institutions. And also to uphold the rule of law and stabilizing the country through democratic solutions. Consequently, the government lacks credible institutional and political muscles to offset the influence of local power brokers. Therefore, accommodation of power brokers in government in governance becomes a policy. <coughs> the Afghan government has increasingly relied on corruption in fiscal patronage networks and contributed to abuse of power. The situation promotes corruption that permeates not only governance, but also the political and economic sectors and becomes a major hurdle in the way of achieving security and development. Therefore, the main actors on the Afghan political scene include weak state institutions, strong insurgents, and opportunistic non-state patronage networks. The strategic context where the transition takes place is complex and multidimensional. The interplay between three forces and their associates will determine or shape the future of that. <coughs> These three are the Afghan government, the armed opposition forces, the US-led international security forces, or ISAF, in other domestic and foreign actors who are aligned directly or indirectly with the three major players that will shape the future of Afghanistan. A military security transition in 2014, therefore, is not a guarantee for peace and stability in Afghanistan without meaningful reform in the Afghan government. <coughs> Nor does a peace deal with a Taliban by itself promise sustainable peace in the region? 
sustainable peace in the region can be achieved only through the establishment of an end state that's acceptable to the Afghan people, while it does not undermine the, the legitimate security interest of other actors in the region and beyond. This is the state addressing legitimate national, regional, and international concerns emanating from the situation in Afghanistan. Given the local and regional political and security dynamics, the transition process is going to be multidimensional, complex, and non-linear. The key to achieving this goal is predicated on a number of assumptions. I have counted four. First, the Afghan national security forces attain the capacity to deal with the security threats independently or with the reduced presence of these forces. Second, the reconciliation process in Afghanistan moves forward to a point that leads to reduced level of threat. And third, Taliban sanctuaries in Pakistan are removed or minimized through cooperation of the Pakistan government. And fourth, progress toward implementing political reform pledged by the Afghan government as part of the intercal or transition process in making the government accountable to people and widely represented. For the rest of this talk, I will focus on these four issues. First, let's speak about the prospect of building a uh, security capacity that can actually uh, independently deal with the challenges of security in the country. The US led military strategy envisions reversing the momentum of the insurgents and drawing them to the negotiating table, allowing a gradual drawdown of US forces and shifting the security responsibility to the Afghan national security forces as they progressively become more capable of doing the job. That is a very major challenge, a very, very major task. The projected target date for this shift is 2014. Establishing long-term security will therefore require a professional, enduring, self-sustaining Afghan national security force. The U.S. led counterinsurgency strategy supported by a military surge in 2009-2010 has blunted the insurgents momentum in key areas and helped significant build up of Afghanistan national security forces. These gains are real, but reversible. Despite a major effort by the NATO training mission in Afghanistan in recent years, the development of the institutional capacity of the Afghan national security forces will take years. It has only been since 2008 that serious commitment has been made in adequate resources invested to create an effective Afghan national army and Afghan national police. So the force has a long way to go before it becomes fully capable of the independence. When I say it is recent, because if we go to the past, when I was Minister of Interior, the, uh, in that, at that time, Minister of Interior also was responsible for provincial governments, district governments, municipalities. At that time, the budget of the Minister of Interior was $127 million a year. Today, the cost of training of police and army in Afghanistan, supported 90% by the United States, is $1 billion a month which amounts to 12 billion a year. That's what I'm saying, that the real serious effort to build Afghanistan national security forces actually started in 2008 or 2009. Uh, the total strength of uh, Afghan national security forces in October 2011, a few months back, reached a little over 300,000 uh, soldiers and about 136 uh, policemen. Total 300 was 300,000. Future plan and visit, uh, increase <coughs> of army and police to 352,000 by October 2012. 
final Afghan national security forces and strength uh, in post-2014, however, remains to be determined by prevailing security, <coughs> political, and by financial conditions. Now, there are three major challenges facing the Afghan national security forces developed. First, given the training facilities, available funds, and abundance of volunteer recruits, this goal can be achieved easily in America. But what will make the NSF or Afghan national security forces a formal approach is their quality, including their professional institutional capability and their capacity to function in a stable and conflict an unstable to conflict in the environment. Those who come from the military background know very well that armies are built in decades, not in years. The army that actually <coughs> is a professional army and believe in what it's doing, believe in the cause that they are doing. Furthermore, the, the effectiveness of the national security forces depends on simultaneous development of other government institutions. Armies do not emerge in isolation from other state institutions. This means that Afghan national security forces is years away from becoming a fully effective force. Therefore, there's no guarantee that the Afghan national security forces will be able to take the lead in fighting the Taliban by 2014 if there is no political settlement in the insurgency continue. The Afghan national security forces also are also handicapped by limited firepower in enablers. When I say enablers, that's the uh, particular logistics, intelligence capability, protected ground mobility, and the airlift capacity. Because the Air Force of Afghanistan will be partially built by 2016, only with the capacity <coughs> of transportation here. Uh, of course, I'm not going to uh, give you the, the, the uh, piece of the uh, U.S. Department of Defense uh, assessment of it, which means out of 364 units, only one unit was assessed as being able to independently conduct the job. Another challenge is the, in the Afghan government is, is the Afghan government's ability to sustain Afghanistan national security forces. It is expected by the 2014, the cost of uh, Afghan national security forces will be between six to eight billion dollars. That's half of GDP of Afghanistan. So, uh, according to the estimates of the, uh, the uh, International Monetary Fund, Afghanistan can be able, if the rate of uh, uh, growth sustains at 9 to 10 percent, which is the trend from 2002. Only by 2023, 10 years probably uh, after 2014, Afghanistan will be able to pay for its security forces. So therefore, there is a need that the international community has to pay for the army. Otherwise, you know the danger of a, a, an army with no pay that can, can cause you know, chaos in the country. Uh, the other uh, option is if by 2014, political settlement reaches a point that you do not need a large army in the force. Or the third option is if to switch that, as some people suggest in Afghanistan, to a draft army, which is given the unstable condition of Afghanistan, is next to impossible. Third, no credible military capacity can be developed in a vacuum, as I said before. Legitimate security forces are created by a state whose citizens view it as legitimate and worth fighting for. Building security capacities is not simply an exercise of generating more and more battalions or police units. It requires that the security forces be developed in the context of an integrated civil military institution building effort. The development of the Afghan National Army and National Police without regard to the other weaknesses in the Afghan government, such as the rule of law, corruption, 
the influence of non-state power brokers in ethnically based patronage networks will seriously undermine the effectiveness of the force, no matter how numerically strong it may be. Armies, national armies, are built by national governments. Factual governments only create factual armies and factual groups. Efforts should be focused on consolidating various institutions in an attempt to curb the influence of predatory power brokers. Otherwise, government and civil institutions will continue to serve uh, the personal and group interest of non-state actors as you see it today in Afghanistan. Now the second uh, uh, condition for a successful transition is prospect for political settlement. The gap between the assumed level of threat in the Afghan security forces capacity to meet them by 2014 is expected to be wide in real. So by two, when we reach 2014, and given the, the current situation of Afghanistan and the way that the, the uh, international, I mean, the uh, national security force are there, there is going to be a, a gap between the level of threat on the one hand and the capacity of Afghan national security to respond to. This gap, no major sustainable international force will be available to fill the gap. Therefore, achieving a political settlement to end the conflict will make it manageable by the Afghan security forces is seen as a pressing need in a strategic effect. That is actually the, the, the rush to political settlement before 2015. Prospect for political settlement are linked to progress in military situation on the ground, addressing the grievances that fuel the insurgency in improvement uh, in government, <coughs> in good governance, in the rule of law, uh, or to, the pre, uh, uh, to conditions for, for prospect for political settlement. Cooperation from the neighbors, particularly in Pakistan, where the insurgents' sanctuaries are based, is also essential for achieving peace in Afghanistan. There are, again, a number of uncertainties and challenges facing the reconciliation process and eventually a uh, prospect for a political settlement. First, in spite of an increasing international momentum and support of seeking a peace settlement in Afghanistan, the efforts so far have been fragmented, uncoordinated, and lack transparency. The Afghan government has been involved for several years in contacting selective Taliban members with no tangible results. Even with the appointment of 68 member High Peace Council, the Afghan leadership failed to identify credible interlocutors, their agenda, in their legitimacy for peace talks. Such contacts and shit suffered major setback in September 2011 with the tragic assassination of the chief Afghan government negotiator, the former president, Rahmadi Rabbani, by a suicide bomber posing as a Taliban peace emissary. The main question concerns who represents the Taliban and what peace means to different parties to the conflict. The U.S. back opening of a Taliban representative office in Qatar, endorsed by Kabul and Taliban representatives, is expected to serve as a means at least to identify the armed opposition in its legitimate interlocutors. Most importantly, the move could be used as a test of whether the Taliban are serious about peace or they are using the opportunity for tactical gains. In either case, the attempt is worthwhile. There's one thing that we have to bear in mind, given other examples of similar situations around the world. Negotiation with the insurgents take years. From the time you establish contact, from contact you move to, to uh, dialogue, <coughs> from dialogue you move to negotiations, from negotiation to settlement. So Afghanistan is not an exception. So therefore, the danger is this, that uh, we rush for tactical gains for settlement that eventually will undermine the whole 
instability. Second, the insurgents are fragmented and influenced by Pakistani intelligence in varying degrees. Inside Afghanistan, the Taliban has become a brand name for various groups who pursue different agendas. An array of opportunists ranging from political factions to criminal groups in tribal networks, as well as aggrieved communities in ill-treated uh, tribes, all call themselves part of the Taliban, not because they share their ideology or, or, or plan, but, uh, and all of their ethos, but to legitimize themselves and their struggle. So who represents the insert? Some people believe that, okay, you go ahead and negotiate with as many as you can in order to reduce the level of threat. But there will all be support. Third, Washington's decent heightened sense of urgency to engage with the Taliban stoke up Afghanistan's volatile ethnic politics. See it as a means of U.S. exit strategy and an instrument of maintaining power by President Karzai, certain opposition forces dispute the timing of the peace initiative, arguing that conditions on the ground are not conducive to achieving a desirable outcome uh, via talks with the Taliban. They support a longer counterinsurgency operation by NATO in Afghanistan and the creation of much stronger effective Afghan security forces that would ensure negotiation are undertaken from a position of strength. However, the exit strategy is looming there. But the exit strategy, as Henry Kessinger once said, is more on exit than on strategy. Four, a political settlement in Afghanistan is an efficient means of achieving U.S. strategic objectives that seek preventing the use of Afghan territory by international terrorism and securing sustainable stability in the region. This, this is something that influences the, the mind of policymakers in Washington and in Europe. The settlement would significantly lower U.S. short-term military costs in Afghanistan its long-term financial expenses to sustain Afghanistan national security forces. However, given the reducing influence as the troops draw down proceeds, coupled with the political and financial pressure at home, there is a narrowing window for the United States to achieve a negotiated settlement from a position of relative strength. The more troops leave Afghanistan, the, 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 the weaker becomes the position of the NATO forces to, uh, to negotiate. <coughs> this explains the urgency of recent U.S. efforts to push for negotiation with the Taliban. Given the U.S. rush for a deal from weakening position, where is the real incentive for the Taliban to seriously <coughs> negotiate? There is a risk of realities being eclipsed by bureaucratic achievements. Fifth, there's a close link between a political strategy of negotiation and military action on the ground. Historically, negotiated ends to insurgencies have taken an extended amount of time and have been conducted in parallel with combat. So in either strategy, talks and fighting are likely to go on simultaneously for some time until an environment conducive to a sustainable settlement, including local or general ceasefire, is created. This concept underpins the so-called fight, talk, and build approach recently promoted by the United States. Now, there is a tension. There is criticism from Afghan side of night raids to target uh, Insurgents. Well, in all country insurgency operations, it's not it is a, it is a very effective means. However, just opposing this is the tension between the position of the Afghan government and the, 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 the uh, NATO forces is creating this distrust. Of course, one has to deal with the, the, the risk that is caused by, by uh, the uh, Certain casualties, but it does not mean that we have to give up a 
kind of a weapons that can be used effectively in the government settings. This is going to be one of the major hurdles in the <coughs> strategic partnership pact between Afghanistan and the United States. So, still there are still there are real risks that the, the peace process may not succeed by 2014, either because of Taliban disinterest or lack of commitment to the process by local and regional actors. In this case, the study should anticipate a, 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 an alternative. What is this alternative? A normal presence of international military forces? Well, there's no stomach for it. A strategic partnership between uh, Afghanistan and the, and the United States, which actually faces many, many, many challenges today, is probably one uh, another thing to think about. And uh, also, some kind of regional understanding that started in the uh, Istanbul conference, but still it is very, very uh, useful. Given the situation in 2014, the, in 2014, the level of progress for the negotiation, political settlement, the effectiveness of the Afghan security forces, the effectiveness of Afghan government to the level that people will trust the government, and also the level of residual presence of the peace forces in Afghanistan. All are interrelated. If there's nothing else, there's no settlement, and the, uh, the Afghan security forces are not able to respond to the challenges, we will need a stronger presence of the international forces. Some people think about 25,000. If this, the settlement you know, takes place, if the Afghan security forces are better organized, better you know, prepared, then probably there's no need for the, for the uh, residual presence of the international So therefore, these are all kind of uh, elements that will be the, decide the shape of the, of the future. Now, of course, the uh, ongoing process of reconciliation of Afghanistan being, uh, you know, I'm not going to talk about the, the ongoing group because we will say uh, standards I will talk about this. Uh, but I have to emphasize one thing. That peace talks are simply a means to an end, where the end is a peace settlement that is legitimate, inclusive, and sustained. Legitimate, inclusive, and sustained. A settlement that all Afghans are willing to accept in the regional uh, countries. That's it. No matter how these talks will go, the end is, is if it does not serve the end, talks are talks, and talks are cheap. Uh, the, uh, but the uh, regional actors, I'm not going to talk about this tonight because tomorrow we have another panel. But there's three groups of, of, of countries that actually affects the, the, the uh, desire to, to, to create a regional kind of a, uh, consensus, regional group in order to bring peace to Afghanistan. What is the relationship between India, Pakistan, Afghanistan? Can we deconflict the, the in Indian uh, and Pakistan policies in Afghanistan? Second, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan. What kind of a Settlement comes down and that will be acceptable to God knows to Pakistan and say that. And third is the, the, the major power, that's US, China, and Russia. Uh, I will not talk much about this. And then, of course, there's one uh, major uh, event uh, you know, that takes place this month or later. That's the Afghan government should circulate a paper at the end of this month. Uh, uh, outlining a kind of a contact group in the region as, as it was called by the, the Istanbul conference. Something like, some people believe this should be something like the, uh, a model of uh, uh, organizations of security and cooperation in Europe, which will include the heart of Asian nations. The heart of Asian nations are those who participate in Istanbul, about 14 to 13 countries. Uh, that paper, should be circulated at the end of this month by Afghanistan. And then in June, probably, we will see what, how is it received 
by the people. So far, I think there's a lot of uh, differences about that group because on the Russian side, the, the organizations of, of, uh, of uh, the uh, Shanghai cooperation is considered to be one model. ECO is another model. And uh, therefore, I think it is going to have uh, you know, a lot of uh, you know, uh, a lot of hurdles in this way. The uh, finally, we are talking about the government. Nothing is going to work unless the government of Afghanistan has to be before itself. In the uh, Kabul conference uh, the, uh, in 2010, uh, the, uh, the Afghan government pledged to implement a new approach termed as a whole of the state approach, a whole of government path to national renewal. The essence of the whole of the state is constitutionalism. To strengthen each of the three branches of government and to reinforce the constitutional checks and balances that guarantee and enforce <coughs> citizens' rights and obligations. However, little change has uh, occurred so far. The drawn-out standoff between the executive, legislative, and judiciary last year has created a serious constitutional crisis in the country that threatens the very foundation of democratic institutions. The essence of tool of government approaches structural reform to create an effective, accountable, and transparent government that can deliver services to the population and safeguard national interests. There are three major factors to improve, uh, improve this situation. One, the relationship between the center and benefits. Second, the, the, the upholding the rule of law. And third, fighting. Of this, the most important thing is the, the, the structure of the government. Unfortunately, there's a lot of power concentrated in the office of the president, but no capacity to use it effectively. So therefore, all decisions are arbitrary, transient, and uh, The relationship between the center and peripheries, even in the context of constitution, without changing constitution, is flawed by three major problems. The, represent, the political representative, political representation, <coughs> fiscal representation or capacity, and administrative capacity. In Afghanistan, although the, the constitution of Afghanistan approved <coughs> the centralized system in Afghanistan because of the ills and negative impact of decentralization of power during the Civil War. But currently, the structure is such that it has the negative impact of both centralized system and decentralized system. It is actually decentralized <coughs> because the government cannot control those who want to become outlaws in the provinces. <coughs> and decentralization, it has the ills of decentralization too. A successful government in Afghanistan is the one who steals from the national capital. Because the governor of a province is not politically representing the country, because it does not uh, has uh, influence in the, on different departments of the province who are reporting to their ministries in court. So the governor is not in charge of these all departments, actually, yeah. practically. Unless you become, break the law, and become in, in a bully in order to, you know, bring them under your, your, your control. Second, the, the, the provincial government and district government do not have a budget, because the budget is the sum of the budget of department of provinces who get their budget from, from center from the ministry. So for a government, in order to make things happen, that's not, unless he steals from the public credit. Third, uh, uh, provincial government, government, the district government, do not have, they, they do not have administrative power. They do not appoint people, except very low level employees. All of their employees are appointed from the ministries of government. Therefore, 
this system has both the negatives of a centralized system, it has the negative system of a decentralized system. Maybe one day, Afghanistan will be able to change the structure. But before you do it, change the constitution, there are ways within the current constitution to change it. And uh, finally, the economy has two major challenges to, to, to the first transition. First, the withdrawal of international forces from Afghanistan. I can see two minutes. Two long minutes. I can see the, 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 the withdrawal of international forces from Afghanistan is going to burst the bubble of development in Afghanistan. According to the, uh, uh, the uh, surveys, World Bank, in the past several years, 50% of the uh, Afghan economy was based on services. Services still that actually also cater to international forces. In, in the, in the, but 90% of uh, public uh, expenditure of Afghanistan came from outside. It does not mean that all this money went to Afghanistan, many of these many countries, those countries, more countries, but still it is going to affect the, the, the uh, economic situation. Measures are needed to be taken to absorb the shock, kind of shock, I mean, the sudden shock of uh, the use uh, money coming from the country. I think the U.S. Congress has come up with some kind of uh, guidelines. I hope that will be. But the long term, Afghanistan's economy needs to be based on two uh, you know, sectors. One, domestic sectors, which is agriculture and mining, and the, dog, and the other one is the regional integration. I will stop here without going to the conclusion because we have the, the time later on to talk about the conclusion. But I uh, Thank you very much for your time. <laughs> Thank you uh, very much, uh, Professor Dalai. That was a very, very comprehensive overview of the entire uh, issues facing uh, Afghanistan at the moment. Uh, in particular, of course, the, the difficulty of getting the national security forces to take on the role after 2014 has been very excellently expounded by you. But there are a couple of other things which, which, uh, which for me as a, an economics background I found extremely fascinating and that is the need to evolve a vibrant federal structure given the fact that uh, there are so many disparities between regions and uh, provinces. A federal sector which is not just military in control and federal in, in name but actually federal structure which then perhaps leads to a unified uh, governance which represents the uh, federal units as well. I think that was a very important point. And the fact about uh, agriculture, mining, and trade as being the finally the resources of development of, of, of Afghanistan. I think I consider this as um, an economics point of view, very important takeaways. Uh, we, we, we will now uh, get a different perspective on the challenges of institution building in Afghanistan. Spousy Kofi is a member of a parliament representing the Lakshan province in Afghanistan. She was elected as a deputy speaker of the Afghan parliament in 2005 and is the first lady elected deputy speaker in Afghanistan history in the country's first democratically elected parliament after 33 years of conflict. In 2000, she has been working with UNICEF Afghanistan as a project officer for child protection. She has been involved in implementing national programs such as BDR for ex child soldiers and their reintegration, as well as combating women and child trafficking. She has worked voluntarily as head of in international development of the Lakshan Volunteer Group. Women and Association during the Taliban regime. She is known as a women and child rights activist in Afghanistan. 
She earned her master's degree in business management from Princeton University in Pakistan and is currently enrolled at the law faculty of Kabul University. Her recent book, Letters to My Daughters, is a must read memoir for anybody who needs to know about Afghans, women's courage and struggle to rebuild their country, to rebuild their country. Ms. Paul Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Manan. Um, allow me to thank uh, ISAS for organizing a timely, important uh, workshop about an important subject in Afghanistan, which uh, uh, right now keeps the mind of every Afghan, and I'm sure our international allies busy. Uh, that is the transition of the 2014. Um, and, and what will happen in the other uh, part of the world. Uh, being a, not a first, first speaker, um, your job is much more e easier, especially speaking of Mr. Uh, Jalali. Um, my job is easy because I don't have to go to all the issues that um, His Excellency mentioned. Uh, but I will briefly uh, talk about um, um, the challenges of uh, institutional building in Afghanistan, representing, um, um, of course, uh, Afghan parliament. Um, I just arrived this morning and I think uh, talking to different people here and seeing the level of interest in this part of the world about Afghanistan gave me a motivation and encouragement that uh, the world will not forget Afghanistan. Uh, I'm sure you will agree with me that the main issue face, uh, facing post-conflict society is to construct a politically stable and democratic state. A state that has the institution and legitimacy to remain viable in the long run. In Afghanistan, two decades of civil conflict were brought to an end in December 2001 with the Bonn Agreement. This agreement laid the framework for building a functioning and democratic government. Ten years later, today, democracy is in Afghanistan is a critical juncture. Significant progress has been made in some areas but it's threatened by the failure of central government institutions to deliver the basic services of a functioning state. Weak institutions have led to a deterioration of security and have undermined the process of state building. This means the creation of institutions is being pushed by the international donors keen to adhere that um, to a timetable withdrawal without ensuring that these institutions have the fi uh, financial, human, and physical resources to function effectively. After withdrawal and when transition is being completed, Afghans' interest in functioning effectively in a democratic state will still be like a dream. The state building process results in a fundamental restructuring of many um, faces of a society. Changes the way that the state relate, relate to the rest of the world. Several concerns that either shape the state building process or that arise directly from it can be identified. Establishing peace and security is also a major state building concern particularly in a country like Afghanistan that has experienced decades of violence con and, and conflict. Without the rule of law and equal social development that address the social needs of citizens from all parts of the country, it becomes next to impossible to deal with other aspects of state building. Afghanistan has ratified United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325, called for an end to impunity for war crimes committed against women and, and girls, but also recognize the need to increase women in peace, peace and negotiations and in peace building. Right now, 28% of the MPs are women. However, the role in peace and reconstruction, as well as transition, is worrisome. Social welfare is another issue that all states must deal with. Yet developing and sustaining infrastructure to meet social welfare needs like healthcare and education are considerably more com complex in a post-conflict setting. 
reconstruction of the economic political institution is perhaps the most important means to ensure long-term success of a state without a well-functioning government that will be able to deliver and fulfill its basic commitments no state will be able to maintain basic state function too much focus on security creates a sense of being penalized in some parts of the country where security is relatively stable right now almost 70 percent of the afghan budget is being spent on security this gave a sense of ignorance in other parts of the country where they are they try to keep security in their region controlling afghanistan following NATO's departure 2014 will not be possible unless the international community establish a realistic strategy for the government to respect the rule of law and deliver good governance. Parliament and Supreme Court are two important institutions that could keep the country on secure and continue to develop its nascent democracy. Afghanistan has been ruled by the same people for the past 13 years. Now it's time for us to open gateway for traditionally marginalized groups to participate in the government. The later transition of security forces in Afghanistan could be effective if we, if we put the right people in the, in the right position. Especially our new high-tech generation, the youth have learned enough and now know how to deserve and, and serve, how to serve people and their country. Our main concern is the insurgency. We do not have a strong engagement with the Pakistani government about our borders. Securing our borders is the only way to stop the Taliban from attacking our, our cities. The Taliban must stop getting military supplies from the other side of the border. Bonn and other international conferences have not addressed this issue, especially the fact that Pakistani government did not participate in the, in the Second World Conference, still remain this, um, this issue as an adverse issue, an adverse issue. We cannot have a state of Afghanistan without stopping FDS threat um, that's coming from alongside the border. Additionally, establishing parallel processes from the government of Afghanistan undermine the rule of democratic institution. Democra parallel processes to democratically elected institutions, like the Ulama Council, for instance. The one that bring the more concern is such institutions. Ulama Council or Shurai Ulama is um, one of those institutions that um, in many ways act on behalf of the institutions. Citizens fear that they do not have the religious freedom that if they do not have the strong rules uh, in decision making, especially in, um, in, in decision in freedom of um, choices. Such institutions endanger Afghanistan uh, democratically elected institution. We have to bring our religious elders to, this, to the table and remove parallel processes that fares by providing them with legitimate Islamic resources and engage them in the legitimate institutions such as parliament. This will prove freedom never hurt our religion. In the longer term, to, uh, to prove uh, Afghanistan uh, institutions um, uh, and their power, um, is to respect the independency of each institution. As stated by previous speaker, right now the whole power basically lies with president office. And I think this is the time for us to take of decentralization, politically and administrative wise. Um, it, it's proof that the current government in Afghanistan is one of the most centralized government in the world. Um, for a local admin staff, to get the permission of um, expenditure for $5,000 in cases of emergency, it will take him or her uh, a year to get that approval um, before, uh, before something happens. So in case of emergencies, especially a natural disaster, you can imagine how um, quickly we can be responsive to the people's need. And this, with this, I would like to end, and I would like to thank you once again 
for your attention and, and for organizing this timely important conference. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ms. Kofi, for bringing to attention the difficulties of building institutions in a fragmented society. Again, we go back, I mean, interesting, I go back to the same issue of a, of a centralized uh, financial government, financially controlling government, trying to reach out to a vast country of uh, different uh, understandings and different requirements, and what kind of institutions will suit the future of this country. So we have a, a, a already built a framework today of, of, of uh, the difficulties of, of uh, securing the establishment through the security forces, the difficulties of building institutions uh, in a, I would call it a unitary government. And now let us go forward and try and look at uh, the issues which are which are absolutely vital, and that is the peace, reconciliation, and reintegration of Afghanistan, challenges and milestones. And we have with us uh, His Excellency, the Mr. Stanksad, who is a Minister Advisor on Home Security to the President of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, and Secretary General for the High Peace Council of Afghanistan, an organization that leads the national peace and reconciliation efforts. The minister has served as the vice chair of the Afghanistan Demobilization and Reintegration Commission, responsible for the disbandment of illegal armed troops since 2005. Between 2002 and 2004, he served as minister for telecommunication of the Afghan transitional government. He has over 25 years of experience in management, design, and implementation of programs and projects in different sectors, including telecom, humanitarian aid, community development, security sector reform, and governance. He has worked with the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission, NGOs, the UN, and private sectors in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Iran. In his current position as the Secretary General of High Peace Council and CEO of Afghanistan, Peace and Reintegration Program. Minister Stansai leads joint interministerial efforts to implement peace, reconciliation, and reintegration programs. He holds a master's degree in philosophy of engineering for sustainable development from Cambridge and a master's degree in business management from Western University. Some of his recent publications include Fighting Afghanistan's insurgency, a fragmented approach towards peace and reconciliation. Afghanistan not lost, but maintained small attention. And security sector reform in Afghanistan, insights from the field. His Excellency, thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Narayan, and uh, uh, let me to talk and uh, taking into account the keynote speaker who mentioned that we have to be forward looking and to think about the future. And uh, I joined my, with my uh, other uh, colleagues who spoke about the challenges, the difficulties, the impossibilities, and the possibilities. And I think I will start with the tool that how we can change it to the positive tool. And I will start with something that, uh, that can encourage us to, to see the different issues and how we can debalance and then we don't trust the hope, but we have to be hopeful for a, a stable and peaceful Afghanistan. I think for the first time uh, uh, since uh, the, the 2001, uh, there was a lot of debate about the policies, strategies, and discussions. And uh, every time when something goes wrong, then we get back and say that we should have a new strategy, and we should have a new policy, and then we don't think about the implementation, we don't think about how we can cover and, 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 uh, and uh, fulfill the, the gap that does exist in implementation of the different policy strategies adopted over the past 10 years. 
there is also, we have to recognize that there was also a sense of mixed vote, significant progress in some sectors, and at the same time, failure in others, because there was not a balanced attention to all sectors and all areas of importance. And taking into account the complexity of Afghanistan, as uh, it was also mentioned by Professor Jalali, that uh, Afghanistan, they, it is not only the insurgency, it is not only the, the cross-border fighting, it is, it is a combination of a legacy of uh, uh, nearly 33 years of war that each, each cycle of conflict has left uh, a difficulty, a problem, a division, a grievance uh, that's inherited by the current administration. We are not only facing with, uh, uh, with the governance problem, we are facing with the, 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 the operation of the criminal networks, we are facing with the, with the drug problem, we are facing with uh, a very difficult neighborhood, and, uh, and we have to live in this neighborhood, and we have to find a way that how we can live in peace with each other uh, in order to, uh, uh, to prosper uh, uh, together, because the region will not be able to prosper individually. We are entering our culturally, socially, uh, security-wise, and also on the trade and investment. We have plenty of opportunity that if that is utilized effectively, I think Afghanistan can be a, a, on, the, on the right path for development. In 2009, after all this debate on the policies and strategies, with the basis of analysis that both the international community and the Afghan government, and also our think tank uh, individuals in the different uh, uh, academics who contributed, that we must learn from the lessons of the past. And uh, unfortunately, one thing is very clear in, in all the cases of conflict and post-conflict that every time we say that we have to learn from the experience of the past, but we will repeat the same mistake in, this, in so many different countries. Uh, and uh, and uh, then we will say that, yes, this time we will learn from the mistake of the past. But we learn from some mistake of the past about the fragility of the efforts, about the lack of coherence, lack of coordination. And uh, if you look today, and if uh, some of, uh, of our friends remember the inauguration speech of President Karzai for his second term in the office, he mentioned five key priorities for Afghanistan to move into a path of stability in the European peace. The first important issue was the Afghan sovereignty. How to achieve a sovereign Afghanistan that can stand on its own feet to begin with the process of transition and with a process that will allow us to strengthen our national security and civilian institution. The second important aspect was that no conflict will end with only using the military means. There should be a political process that is consistent and that is broad, inclusive, and led by Afghan. Because in the past, we had so those efforts, but those efforts were not well coordinated. They were different positions. The government will announce one thing, and then the next day the UN will say something different, and the third day the US will say something different. So I mean that that was the fragility of our efforts in terms of how to deal with the peace, reconciliation, and the integration efforts. That was his second important goal that we have to work uh, for his second term. The third very important issue was the issue of governance, as uh, everybody mentioned, the importance of the governance in the rule of law and its interconnection on our wider efforts to make it sustainable. The core of these two efforts of the governance is investment on the human capital because it is the human capital that will help the, the government to move and that is the political will that requires that those 
trained, educated, new generation of uh, trained human resources to be allowed and given the chance that they can flourish and they can take the leadership. At the same time, there is the issue of fighting corruption. That is, that is something I hope we learn more from, uh, from Singapore in terms of management, reforming the, the governance, and at the same time, making it more effective. Uh, and this is why I'm very pleased to be here, and I think uh, the sharing of experience of people from Singapore and countries who made overcome some of the biggest challenges they faced in the past, like in Afghanistan, the drug problem, the issue of uh, corruption, the issue of poverty, and I think those could be a very kind of a role model that we can use them and we can benefit from them. The fourth important issue was, as uh, 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 Professor Jalali mentioned, uh, investment on key areas uh, and sectors, which was largely ignored uh, the end of 2007. And those sectors are the energy, mining, agriculture. But agriculture without water, it is nothing in advance. Uh, sometimes our people are just saying as a framework that agriculture in Afghanistan is a God-led agriculture because if there is enough rain, if there is enough snow, because there is no water management system effectively in place because of the drought, because of the climate changes, uh, I think that is another very key and important area that, uh, that is made as a priority. Fifth, is our relation with the region. Our cooperation in the region is very key for the stability of Afghanistan, for the economic prosperity, for the trade and transit. And Afghanistan can be well placed as a land bridge in, the, in this trade and transit business in the heart of Asia. But it needs investment on infrastructure, on the form of custom, on, uh, on facilitating or improving security. And I think those kind of investment or the kind of a cross-border investment in energy, on transport, on, on trade, on, the, on, on like the gas, the, the, the gas pipeline and others, are important inter interconnected between the countries in the region. Uh, sometimes we only take, take things technically that for a short term, we can have some, some discussion, some diplomatic engagement, but the next day we have a turbulence in the relation because there is, there is, there is, there is not issue that connect us and the people can feel that these, those issues uh, will help the people to much really benefit. 